All right, hello guys, Renan Boy here, and today we're back with the Python tutorials, and we will be going over functions today. So basically, I went over functions a little bit last time. Functions are basically a group of related statements that are used to perform tasks. They are useful in helping to break our program into smaller chunks. Instead of having to write a program all at once, we can make it more modular, which makes it more reusable, especially when you're coding in a team or with other people. And it helps us avoid repetition. Now, a basic form of function, a basic syntax of a function has the following. Let me just, uh... So, in order to define a function in Python, you need the def keyword, the name of the function, the parameters that go inside it, though you can leave this empty if the function is not returning anything, the colon at the end, because everything inside of this colon, which is separated by four spaces, one tab, will be the insides of your function, a doc string, which is basically a simple string saying, that explains the purpose of this function. So for example, this is an example function that is meant to show the basics of functions. Okay, that's just way too long. It's going over the line. I mean, going over the edge. But yeah, your doc string is basically... Where did I have it written down before? Somewhere, um, yeah. And then below that you have your statements. You're basically the methods and uh, values, variables, basically all the meat of your function. So let's go over a few examples of functions. The most basic are functions with input values. Actually, no, let's just go with a very basic example. This is an example I've showed you a little bit in the last video. It's basically a print function. Print a statement, hello world. And in our doc string, we will say this function Prints, hello world. And it's spelled press extra W there. Run it. Oh, I, I didn't call the function. Oh my god. Sorry guys, I tend to be a little I will, uh, I tend to be a little forgetful at times. Basically, outside of the function's namespace, which is the uh, this line over here, lines two and three, these are basically inside of the function, basically outside of the function, in the scripts namespace, your global namespace, you want to call the function by its name. So let's give it a unique name. Print hello, that's the name of our function. And then we call it by typing it out its name and the parentheses. In this case the parentheses are empty, they're not returning anything, well except for the output of the print statement. But those don't require any input, which is why when we call it, our parentheses are also going to be empty. So when we run it, we get hello world. Right now we will move on to a function with an input. So in this case let's just say name. And we'll make this a very uh, short one. So in this case we have printed out, we have written a variable for our function called name which exists in the local namespace of the function for lines 2 and 3. This is giving us an error because I have not written anything here, but let's, let's write a name. Well, in this case, it'll have to be a string, because print, it's printing out a string. So, John Doe. Alright, that gets rid of our error. So now, we can use our name in the print statement. So it prints out the string hello, followed by a comma, and then name, which is the string that we inserted when calling. When we call our function, since it has an input variable, it will search for an input of the same type as its output. And in this case, it's like we're giving it the string John Doe, but we can also create a variable. For instance, a separate variable would be our name equals John Doe. And instead of creating writing a string when we call our function, we can just say our name. Now when we print this, we get hello John Doe. So our variable has the string John Doe, which is then placed in our function when we're calling it, which is then sent. It basically assigns the value of our name to name, which is a local variable inside the namespace of the function print hello, which then uses the print method to place that name value at the end of our string, which is how we get hello John Doe. And I think that should be the basics of um, input values. Actually, there is one more thing. We can also input lists, as in we can have more than one input. So instead of just inputting one, 
one variable, we can have multiple. So let me just uh, base this example I have. Display list. All right, in this case, our definition, our function display a list is looking for a list of names. That's where this uh, star character is placed right before names. Placing a star character right before your variable lets the function know that it's expecting more than one value. So, for, so if I were to remove this and ask it to print names, it will give us an error because it takes one position value but four were given. That's because it's not expecting a list, it's, it's expecting a single variable. But when we give it a, when we change it to the star and now it can take in a list, it will print it four times. Hello Monica, which is our first name in our list. Hello Luke, the second, Steve, the third, and John the fourth. We can also create a data type, the list data type, as a variable. So let's just say our names equal Monica, Luke, Steve, and John. So instead of placing all of these right here, you can simply say our name. I think we might need a star here. Let's just try it out real quick. Oh, it's got printed. Brackets don't work for a list. Well, actually, they do. There we go. I yeah, just needed the star again. So rather than printing it all out as one object, the star tells us that it tells the function that it's a list of objects. And then it uses the for loop, which is a data structure I will go over later. And basically, the for for loop is something that will iterate itself through an entire list, going going through the list one at a time, repeating any methods that are inside for every object in the list given. So in this case for name, in names, names being our list that we've provided, the our name, var the our name variable that contains our list is then, is basically, um, what's the word? The list from our name is basically sent to names. So the list of names is now occupied with the same values that are in our name. So for every name, this arbitrary value name that we created, for names, which is every object in the list, it will print hello and then the name object. So it will basically say hello Steve, hello John, hello Monica, hello Luke. Don't trust me, I'm doing it in order. Let me try this one more time. There it is. No, it's not. I'm gonna go over that later. But for the time being, yeah, basically for input va functions with input values, this is how you would do it. Basically anything in these parentheses is an input that the function can take and use it in its methods and basically it can use it for any process you're creating inside it and then it can return it out as well. Now speaking of return functions, let me uh, get into that really quickly. All right guys, so here's a simple example of a return function. Over here, I have an output that I'm going to print, stated as 54, and a print method that will print out our output as it is initially defined, which is 54. Now over here, I have a function, a return function, which I've called return function, that will take in a value. Now the purpose of this function is quite simple. It will take any value assigned to it in the parameters, and it will double it. And the method for that I have created is here. Our new value is equal to our old value that we insert in here, and then we multiply that by two. And then to return the value, we use the return keyword and then value, which is assigned as our new value, not the old one. Basically this method, when it says value is equal to value with any other functionality added in, the statement to the left of the equal sign is the new value, so to say. Now our output is now equal to the, <coughs> is now equal to our function after it runs using the old output as its parameter. So when this function runs, it will take the 54, insert it into the parameters, and then it will double it on line 7, and then it will return the doubled value at line 8. 
So the so saying return function parentheses output is the same as saying value equals value times two, and then it returns that value. So our new output is equal to the return value of this value return value function, uh, return function that I've created. And then on line 11, we have our second print statement that will output the new value, which has been updated at line 10. So when we run this, our output before using it in our function is 54 as defined in line one. And then our output after using using it, okay, I, I made a mistake there, but after using it in our function is 108, which is defined in line 10 and 11, based on the return value function. So that is a simple example of a, of a return function. Uh, let's go over one more example using it. Now let me just uh, copy. Now this function that I have in my notes is a function that will return the absolute value of any value put into it. So in this case, we have on line 11 here, our function being called with a value of 2, which is a positive number. So the absolute value of 2 will still be 2 when I run it. However, in line 14, I'm placing in the parameters a negative number, a negative 4. But the output for this should be 4, since the function is ret returning the absolute value. And here I have the function defined. So here's our input parameter, num. And here we have an if statement, which is a data type I will go over more, in more detail later on, but an if statement is basically, if a certain argument, whether it be true or false, happens, you can create code that will, that will output if a certain parameter is set. And then the other side of the if statement is the else. So in, in this case, let's just say if our parameter here is true, it will return any code that is placed here in line six. Then on the other side, else. So if if is true, else will be false. So in the situation the parameter is false, we'll return any code that we place over here. So in this case, our parameter is num is greater or equal than zero. So if the number, our input is a positive number, it will return that same number unchanged. If it's not a positive number, it will return the number, but it's negative. So a negative of a negative number will be a positive number. So when we run this, we get two and four, even though our inputs were two and negative four. So that is an example of a return function being used. All right, guys, I will now be going over recursive functions. So recursive functions are functions that can call other functions, including themselves. I know that sounds kind of hard to grasp, but I'll go over it in a second. These type of constructs are termed recursive functions. Now, why would we use recursive functions? Well, an advantage of using one is that they can make our code look cleaner and elegant. They can make complex, ta complex and repetitive tasks a lot more simpler to implement. And sequence generation, basically a task that has to be repeated in a sequence or using a certain pattern, can be made easier using nested functions and or recursive functions. Now some disadvantages of using recursive functions are that their logic can be pretty hard to follow through. They can be pretty expensive on your computer, they may take a lot of time and memory, and they can be really hard to debug. Because in a case of a recursive function that's calling itself a bunch of times, it may go correct a bunch, it can go correct for a certain amount of time, but at some, at some loop somewhere it may break, and fixing that could be very difficult. Now here is an, a simple example of a recursive function that I found. Alright, this recursive function is a function that will return the factorial of any x value that we give it. Now, this function is recursive because inside the function's namespace, which is lines 1 through line 8, the function's name is calc factorial, and that same function is called inside itself at line 8. So it's a recursive function because it's calling upon itself, which is a function, a function that can call itself within its functionality. Now, our function is officially called in line 11, so it has to print the statement, the factorial of num, which in this case we define as 4, is our function num, which is 4. Our function num will, upon taking the number 4, will go through an if statement. Now, if our input is 1, it will return 1, because 1 factorial 1, I mean 1 factorial is 1, because 1 times anything is itself. However, if our input is not 1, then it will, re it will return our input multiplied by our same function all over again with our initial value minus 1. 
So if we put in 4, 4 is not 1, so it will skip the if, go straight to the else, and it will return 4 multiplied by our function with 4 minus 1 is 3. So in this case, what this function line, what this, yeah, what this method in line A is saying is it's 4 times calc factorial of 3. Now, when it's calling itself, so it's now, when it calls itself, it loops back. Now it's doing calc factorial of 3. So x is now equal to 3. So it will skip the if again, because it's not 1, and go straight to the else. This time it will be 3 times calc factorial, which is 2. So 4 times 3 times 2. And now with calc factorial 2, I'll have to go back doing calc factorial with 2. 2 is not 1, skips the if. Go straight to else. And we'll do 2 times calc, calc factorial of 1 which, when it loops over again, this time x is 1. So now x is equal to 1, it will return 1. So 2 times 1. And our answer should be 24. I know that's kind of hard to wrap your head around because it's a pretty abstract concept, but, well, the implementation of the code is pretty abstract, though factorials are pretty simple if you have learned it in school. Anyway, let's run this function. And here's our answer. The factorial of 4 is 24 just like we predicted. Alright guys, the last type of function I want to go over right now are lambda functions, also known as anonymous functions. These are basically functions without a name. They're a very cut down version of a function that I've described so far. While normal functions are defined using the def keyword, which is a defined from keyword, in Python you can make an anonymous function by defining the lambda keyword, which is also why they're called lambda functions. Now let's go over a quick example of one. Alright, here I've defined a lambda function, and I've assigned its value to the uh, variable increase value. Well, actually now I've assigned it to the function increase value, which is a lambda function called by the lambda keyword, where it takes the value of x and doubles it. So over here, to the right of the colon, we have a functionality, just like how in a previous, previously defined function. Basically, just like how in a normal function, everything after a colon is its, pro is its functionality, the same applies here. Our input value is x to the left of the colon, except there's no parentheses this time. And there's no name, only a lambda, implying this is a lambda function. The name, actually, it does have a name, but not in the functional sense, more in a variable sense. This function is basically assigned to a variable, which is increased value, which can be called just like a normal function. So just like a function has its parameters, inside it can have the value for its input, can call this variable with parameters with a value for its input the same way we would call a function. So when we print the output of this function it should be doubled. And it is. Now let's compare this to how it would operate if this was normally defined as a non-lambda function. So our lambda x is equal to x multipli multiplied by 2 is the same as defining it in a normal sense. Define our function's name, double, x is our input, where it will return the double of x. Same functionality, but different way of writing it. One of the obvious benefits of using a lambda function is to save space, as well as to save, save, the, num uh, save the amount of typing you have to do. It can also be useful in mapping functions as well as filter functions. Let me just go over those real quick. So, let's go over the filter function, which is used in lists and arrays as well as heaps and basically any other data structure that has a lot of data in it. Basically, the filter function can be called in Python and it takes a list as an argument function is called with all the items in the list and a new list is returned which contains the item for which the function evaluates to true. Basically it filters out, well, let me just show you, let me just show you. Alright so in line one we have our list, it 
has the values 1, 5, 4, 6, 8, 11, 3, and 12, which is about 8 values inside. So now we create a new list, which is a, val which is a variable that is assigned a list, a new list, which is made from the filter function. The filter function, it's basically the output of the filter function, this list, which is filtering the first list using a lambda function we created. So the output, of, the output of our lambda function, which takes an x, which in this case would be my list, it is taking my list, and for every value in my list, it uses the modulus function. I hate it when that happens. And then checking if the modulus is zero. Now what does that mean? That means it's dividing each value in the list by two, and if the remainder is zero, so if these values are even, it will not output, the filter will not output it. However, if they're not zero, so if there is a remainder, the filter will catch that and then assign it to the list, which will be our new list. So, actually no, I think it's the other way around. If it is zero, sorry, if it, if it is zero, then it will send that to new list. Otherwise, if it's not zero, it will filter it out. And for our x value, the filter function actually takes that as a second parameter. So the filter function will take in a lambda function as its first value, and then whatever is supposed to go in the x value for the lambda will be the second value, which is our initial list. And then the output should be 4, 6, 8, 12, the even numbers. And it is. It returns a new list, only containing the even numbers that have no remainder when they're divided by 2. And all the odds are filtered out. Now let me go over the mapping function which is similar to the filter function in which it takes a lambda function as an input value but also takes a list to work with that function as a second value. Actually let me just uh, briefly describe the map function. Alright, so the map function takes in a function and a list, similar to the filter function. And the map function will go through all the items in the list and return a new list for which it will perform a method a function or some function on it. Okay, that was horrible. Let me just explain it by example. Sorry guys, my English isn't exactly... No, my English is okay, it's just... I'm still new to recording on YouTube and just recording in general, so I'm not really used to... Uh, talking to a camera here. I'm mean, talking to a microphone, I mean. It's a new experience. I'm still getting used to it. Anyway, like before, we have a list. Same values. We have a new list that will take in the new list created, this time by the map function instead of the filter function. Like before, it takes in our lambda. Or this time, instead of dividing by 2 to search for a remainder, it will take every value in the list and multiply it by 2. And then the list is inputted in the second parameter. So the map function will take whatever is in the second parameter and feed it to the first parameter, which is our lambda function's in x input. And then the lambda function will take whatever is inputted, each value one at a time, multiply it by two, and output it to the map function. The map function will take each value given to it from the lambda function and put it into the list, which will be then assigned to new list. So our output will be the same values of my list, except each value is doubled. Okay, so it's not the same value, but it's doubling each value. And yeah, that's basically the map function. It's mapping an action from each po each item in the first list to a new item in the same position on a new list. Rather, let me explain this way. So in index position 0, because lists and lists are index 0, 1, 2, 3, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, even though there are 8 items, they start with 0, not 1. So it goes to the first item at index 0. Now it will map to it, it'll go through the function where it will multiply it by 2, and then it will map it in a new list at the same index position. So the first position 0 goes in, doubles it, and then puts it in the same index in the new list. You're basically mapping it, that's what map does. Second position, doubles it, maps it to the same position as the first as it was in the first list, but this time with the new value that it that's that it's given after it goes to the function. Same for 4 to 8, 6 to 12, 8 to 16, 11 to 22, 
3 to 6, and 12 to 24. So yeah, those are a, that's a brief way of using Lambda functions. There are more ways to use it, but for, for a beginner's guide, I think this is enough. This is where I'm going to stop now. In the next video, I will be going over inheritance, and I will see you then. Have a good one, guys.